Hello, um, this is Michelle again. Today we are going to be talking about anger, aggression, and violence. Uh, we are going to break this lecture up, to, up to, into three sections. Um, the first section is just going to be about anger and aggression basics. Um, the second part of the lecture will cover domestic violence and elder abuse. And then the final lecture segment will be on child abuse and sexual assault. So as we know, um, in today's society, anger, aggression, and violence are all around us. We actually are very lucky to live where we do, um, but if we go uh, three hours south of us, um, crime and violence is pretty rampant in the bigger cities. That being said, we are not immune to uh, anger and aggression, and we still um, have to be cognizant that violence is happening where we live. So let's look at anger and aggression and just define what this means. So anger is a normal emotional response that we all have to frustrations. Um, it's a threat uh, to our needs. So we can use ourselves as examples. If we are studying for an exam and we've studied really, really hard, and then you take the exam and you don't do well, it may cause you to have some anger because you're frustrated at how, at how hard you worked for that exam. Um, aggression, on the other hand, is an actual action or behavior that results um, in a verbal or physical attack on someone. Aggression is not always inappropriate and it's sometimes necessary for um, self-protection. However, aggression um, you know, that is intentional to either verbally or physically abuse somebody would be um, a form of aggression. So for instance, um, if a person takes action um, on you and say they rob you or physically abuse you. That would be a form of aggression. Aggression by patients occurs most often when the nurse tries to set limits and the patient feels like um, they're captive or they're unable to do things or he things that they want to do. So another example of aggression might be road rage. When somebody gets so angry that it's taking so long to get through traffic, they may take that anger a step further and drive unsafely and potentially hurting themselves or other people. So that would be aggression. Now violence, violence is the intentional use of force that results in injury to another person. And we have found out that the best predictor of violence is if there has been a history of violence in the past. So here are some assessment guidelines for us as nurses when we are trying to screen people and determine if there are any anger or aggression issues, especially in our mental health patients. I would say that any change in a patient's behavior that is not typical for them, we should be addressing that and monitoring them very carefully because th this is the situation where um, somebody may become um, aggressive or violent towards others. So um, making sure that we're taking a history uh, on them and asking if there has been any violence in their family or perhaps um, have they ever had any instances of violence themselves. Again, any change in patient behavior should, should raise a red flag for us and we should be monitoring that patient very closely. Um, aggression, aggression, again, by patients usually occurs when the nurse is trying to set limits on them and they feel like they have lost control and become angry and aggressive in response to that. Um, so we want to make sure that we're doing a complete and thorough um, history and physical. Um, most of our reactions to stimuli will come from previous experiences. So if they've presented violence or aggression or anger in the past, 
um, this becomes a learned behavior and they are more likely to um, be aggressive or violent in the future. What we know about demographic risk factors is that typically aggression and violence is going to be exhibited in um, persons between the ages of 14 and 24. It is more likely from males than it is from females. Um, we know that low socioeconomic status and inadequate support systems also contribute to um, poor coping mechanisms and the presentation of anger or aggression. So predictors of violence, um, if the patient becomes more hyperactive, if they appear to be increasing in their anxiety level or they, uh, they appear to be very tense, um, if they're talking in a very loud voice, um, sometimes even silence can be a, a, a cue. So if somebody is sitting in silence, they may be stewing about whatever is internally frustrating them or angering them and it could pro uh, progress into aggression. Um, alcohol and drugs and, and drug intoxication have also been implemented in violent acts. Um, that is probably more so because it impairs their judgment and their impulse control. Obviously, possession of weapons is going to be a high risk. Um, environmentally, we have found that typically if there is a warm environment, um, if the environment is very crowded with a lot of people, these, these um, factors increase a person's stress level and irritability and decrease their predictability. So in these situations you may have more likelihood of some aggression or violence. And this becomes really important when you're on the mental health unit and we have several um, people who have some uh, risk factors and um, some inability to control impulses or thought processes all put together on one unit. And so this in itself will precipitate that environment um, to be more volatile. So we have to make sure that we understand that about, about the unit that we're working on. So, there is a cycle of anger, and we will see anger in healthcare. And it comes from, it's not really a cycle, but it's factors that contribute to a person becoming angry. Um, the first one is vulnerability. All of our patients that we're caring for are vulnerable. Um, and in our environment, Basically, patients lose their independence. We become the decision makers. We say what happens, and the patient feels like they lose control. So many hospitalized patients feel vulnerable when they are admitted to an acute care setting, um, just for this reason. This population is also vulnerable because they have a illness. Um, it can be mental health illness or it could be people on our acute care settings that just are dealing with chronic or acute illnesses, um, which contributes to their vulnerability. Um, uneasiness, um, our patients are under a lot of stress due to their health conditions, their disease processes. They feel like they have limited choices or an inability to direct their care. Even though we try to include them in their plan of care, um, they still feel like um, they're not re you know, able to completely make their own decisions. Um, anxiety levels are high. The feelings of uneasiness um, from anxiety with family members and healthcare staff can escalate anger. Um, so anger, if the anxiety gets out of control, it leads to anger. The patient may display shortness with staff, they may yell, their voice may become louder. Those are cues that there is some anxiety and anger uh, surfacing. It will progress to aggression if the anger is not handled appropriately or not um, recognized soon enough and the patient becomes more vulnerable because of the rising anxiety level. And the patient may start to do things like pushing the bedside table away from them or 
turning over in the bed and turning their back to you. These are all signs that there's something going on. This patient is having some kind of anxiety um, and perhaps would be um, open to being aggressive. Violence obviously would be the end result. The patient has become so angry, um, they are, they, um, are uh, so frustrated that they may act out, perhaps by hitting the staff or um, harming their family member that's in the room when they can't handle their own feelings. So what can the nurse do to decrease the risk of anger progressing to aggression or violence? So first thing we need to do is we need to do a self-assessment of ourselves. okay? We need to reflect on how do we feel about different patients and situations. How would we handle a situation if a patient became aggressive? Um, we need to remember that we need to treat our patients the way that we would want to be treated. So if a patient is rude, how are we going to handle that situation? What is our plan going to be? We, we can't ignore the stimuli. We can't ignore the insults. We have to have a plan of how we're going to deal with it. Our ability to handle stress and anger will hinder or help the patient um, be able to handle their anger and aggressive. We have to be really cognizant of our body language. Are our arms crossed? Are we rolling our eyes? Are we just, you know, making short comments to them that indicates we're really not listening or paying attention? So um, we have to be cognizant of that self-assessment of ourself, okay? Then we would want to be making a plan. Um, we need to start with understanding of the patient's medical problems, their stressors, their past medical history. That's going to, again, cue us into if they are going to be more apt to be uh, ag aggressive or violent. Um, we have to understand the patient's ability or inability to handle stress and the potential for that aggressive behavior. So. Um, if something should arrive, what are we going to do? I think the first thing that we need to recognize is that we need to be well versed in what our agency protocol states. So if a, if a patient is showing um, anger, um, inappropriate behavior, progressing to possibly aggression, what does our agency say that we should do? I mean, they, it should indicate when do we call in a second person? When do we call security? When do we use physical restraint? When do we use chemical restraint? This is all going to be mapped out in a safety plan at your um, specific facility that you're working at. We want to make sure that we're listening to the patient and the family concerns and addressing those so that the patient does not get frustrated and, and start the anger cascade. Um, the patient's needs, um, we should reassure them that we are going to the, do the best that we can to meet their needs or to answer their questions, okay? Do we need to demonstrate that willingness to do good for the patient and show that empathy that we have for them? Uh, communication um, should, should have, again, I think we talked about this before, we should have clear guidelines on what the rules and expectations are on our unit and everybody should everybody meaning staff and patients I suppose um, should uh, follow those rules and everybody should be consistent in that plan okay remember again too that we want to be cognizant of our personal space um, therapeutic touch again typically is not a good idea with patients that you're concerned might be having anger or aggression or having difficulties um, controlling their impulses, okay? So we want to make sure that we have that personal space far enough away from the person that they wouldn't be able to reach out and um, grab us or, or hit us. And I use kind of a rule of thumb but an arm's length away from the patient, okay? Um, we always want to be making sure of our escape route. Are we in a good position in the room in which we could um, exit if we needed to, if the person became aggressive? Okay. 
Again, remember your body language. Don't be in a position of towering over the patient and giving them the impression of um, us being superior. Um, we should try and maintain that equal level of conversation with them so that it appears um, that we are responsive and equal to them. Um, another strategy might be to, um, uh, let's see, what am I trying to say? Provide for breaks. So um, again, uh, before we kind of mentioned that when we're dealing with people with mental illness, we do frequent short visits with them. And this allows some break time um, for the patient to uh, have some personal space, okay? So, you know, many hospitalized patients, they don't get enough sleep um, because, you know, we're constantly coming in and interrupting them. And sleep deprivation, we know, does attribute to irritability and um, anger or aggression. So we just have to make sure that we give some structured breaks where the person can have some um, solitude and some um, personal time. So is the environment conducive to violence? We kind of already uh, discussed this a little bit a few minutes ago. Overcrowding and um, warm places, um, a lot of mental health uh, patients that have impulse control issues all in one place can cause um, increased risk for aggression. Clients on the mental health unit have a tendency to rally the crowd. Um, so they, they, they um, um, what's the saying? Uh, the majority overrules the, the fewer. That's not the same, but that's where I'm trying to go with this. So, you know, if you have a bunch of mental health patients and they're talking and they're planning, um, they could very easily um, plan for some kind of staff takeover. And so we always have to be cognizant and monitoring that whole population to see if there's any kind of unusual behavior like that going on that we would want to take note of. Um, and if we notice that there are any cliques forming amongst the patients, it would be a, in our best interest to try and break those cliques up and um, just have them participate in separate activities so they can't um, do this mob mentality uh, planning. Okay. Um, we also could possibly, if behaviors are inappropriate, um, take privileges away. Again, we are already going to have established what is appropriate and inappropriate behavior on the unit. We're going to have established that consistency of our rules. So the patient should have an understanding that if they break any of these rules or the, they um, participate in any of these inappropriate behaviors, that perhaps privileges will be removed from them for um, that behavior. Um, we always want to make sure that we have enough staff on hand. Um, the less staff present, the easier it is for the patients to think that they can act up and control the environment. Um, so in the next slide, we're actually going to talk about how staff can de-escalate or some techniques for de-escalating aggression. So you can see the techniques. Um, I'm not going to read them to you. I am going to point out a few that I think are really important. The very first one, we need to make sure that we are maintaining the patient's self-esteem and dignity. So if the person is uh, exhibiting inappropriate behaviors, we are not going to want to confront them in front of the whole group and humiliate them. What we're going to want to do is try and coerce them to come off um, to a quiet space and have a one-on-one -on -one discussion uh, with you about the inappropriate behavior. Um, the second one, we always want to maintain that calmness about us and that calmness in the unit. We're going to try and decrease as much external stimuli as we can, and we are going to um, make sure that we are always speaking in a neutral voice. 
we're not showing any anger or frustration ourselves, because that will show a weakness and um, the patients will take advantage of that. If you go down a little bit more, there's one that says establish what the patient's concern is. So they're exhibiting anger and aggression because they need something or something is stressing them out that they're not um, able to address. So when we pull this person aside and we have the one-on-one, -on -one, we're going to want to be communicating with them. We're going to be wanting to ask those open-ended questions and try and determine what is the problem here. What is the stressor or the unmet need that the patient feels um, frustrated with that's producing this anger? And if we can get to the bottom of the problem, resolve the issue, we can de-escalate the whole anger cascade. So the sooner we um, respond, the earlier um, is the better, okay? Communication, as always with our mental health patients, is going to be of utmost importance in de-escalating this anger. We want to speak slowly in short sentences using a low, calm voice. Again, open-ended questions, explore those feelings. Um, we want to continue to monitor our protective personal space, uh, watch our body language, and finally provide options um, to the person. So um, we might say, okay, well, this is the behavior that you exhibited. Now, we can handle it this way, we can handle it this way, or we can handle it this way. What would you prefer? And give them some of that sense of control back. And that will also help to de-escalate their anger, okay? So interventions, again, goal is no harm. No harm to the patient, no harm to ourselves, and no harm to others, okay? Now, de-escalation doesn't always work, I will say that. Most of the time we can de-escalate through good communication with the person. But if it doesn't work, we would need to progress to these other interventions, which would include pharmacologic, um, possibly seclusion, and the last straw would be to um, uh, apply restraints, okay? Some um, medications uh, that we might give are going to be the PRN medications, um, and that might be a benzo to try and help calm them down, perhaps an antipsychotic, depends on what's going on. But there are, as you know, some medications that we can utilize to calm the person. We are always going to be wanting to offer oral medications before we would go to an IM injection. Anytime you escalate to IM or IV, um, this is only going to produce more um, frustration and aggression and anger from your patient. So first, you know, offer that oral medication, and if you're not able to get it into them, they're not cooperating, and you have no other um, uh, things to fall back on, then you would have to progress to the IM dosing. But it is not preferred, just so you understand that. Um, seclusion would obviously be to involuntarily confine um, the patient in a room alone, okay? Of course, we would be monitoring the patient, but they would actually be isolated in, say, their bedroom or a designated area where they couldn't, couldn't harm themselves. Um, it's not intended to be punishment. It's intended to keep the patient safe um, and others safe, okay? Now, restraints, again, like I said, would be the last straw. Um, restraints do require a doctor's order, and so we would be needing to contact the physician and get the order to apply restraints. Sometimes, um, depending how violent the patient is, we may actually apply the restraints and then phone the, phone the doctor, um, give him the scenario that happened, the behaviors that were exhibited, um, and what you have done about it so far. He may give you the order to continue the restraints, um, or if he's not in agreement, he may tell you to do something different and remove the restraints. Either or, um, it requires some conversation with the physician. The physician is required to readdress restraint use every 24 hours while they are being um, 
uh, applied to the patient. Um, our responsibility when a patient is in um, is in restraints is that we have to do frequent monitoring and every two hours at minimum we have to actually release the patient from uh, the restraints and allow them uh, to participate in their basic needs such as toileting. Um, and all of these checks, I think they're every 15 minutes, and the t every two hour release of the restraints have to be documented. Now, um, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. I don't know. Okay, so that's, I guess that's all I have to say on restraints. Once the patient has settled down, it is reasonable to um, discuss expected behaviors and consequences for inappropriate behavior. But typically that's not until we've given some PR on medication, um, had some uh, isolation time, um, or potentially applied restraints and they have now calmed down. As far as staff and personal safety, um, we need to be cognizant of how we're dressing, okay? So we want to avoid wearing any dangly earrings, any necklaces, rings, scarves, anything like that that the patient could use to harm you should they become aggressive. We always want to make sure that we have other staff on the unit, so if we need backup, we could uh, call them in. Um, we want to have a good understanding of the unit so that we know where to go for safety and how to perhaps call uh, code. Some facilities um, use code green when they have a, a volatile or violent um, patient. We, uh, again, are always making sure we know what our escape route is and um, we're avoiding confrontation with patients who are angry. Oops, what did I do? Sorry. Okay, so this is just a list of medications that we can use for violent behavior. I don't expect you to memorize these drugs, but some of them, if you notice, are, are, are um, going to be common to you because we've talked about them so many times. So all the benzos in the beginning, we should know all about them. The antipsychotics, such as Haldol and Thorazine, we've talked about those, too. Um, we've talked about Risperidol. Um, Zyprexa, we haven't really, um, but it's in the antipsychotic uh, uh, category or uh, class, so we should know what to expect from that, okay? So really, I think these drugs are not anything new to us, um, and again, these would be the ones that we would be using for um, violent behavior. Okay, I'm going to stop this recording, and the next lecture we'll be talking about domestic violence and elder abuse.